Hi and welcome to Dean Park and my big trip south. At Easter time I took a trip down to London to visit my good friend Richard of Everard Junction. The trip got me out of Scotland for the first time since the Covid pandemic and also allowed me to take a few things off my bucket list. You join me as I take a brisk walk along the length of an LNE Arizuma train at Edinburgh Waverley. This will be my first mode of transport on my trip south. First class accommodation is situated at the front of the train, with standard class from the rear. There are full catering services on board this train, including hot and cold snacks and at-seat dining for first class passengers. This trip was heavily railway based, which included my first trip on an LNE Arizuma, my first ride behind a class 45 peak, and my first experience travelling on a sleeper. The latter being something I've wanted to do for decades. I also spent an enjoyable two days with Richard at his layout, where I was able to see some of his latest work up close while running some of my own stock on his tracks. That section of the video will also include a how-to as both Richard and I demonstrate some excellent painting and weathering techniques that anyone can achieve. I'll be popping in and out of the video with some narration to give the clips some context. If you enjoy the video please give it a like and if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to my channel. In the meantime, sit back and relax as I share the sights and sound of my big trip south. Time for me to get on board the Azuma for the first time. For this trip, I've treated myself to first class. Initial impressions of the first class on these new trains is favourable. They've all the latest tech for seat booking, a far cry from the paper labels of the BR Mark III days. I've also heard a lot of things about the awful seats on these new trains, but in first class they're actually pretty good. They recline and have charging points at every seat. However, they're not as padded and supportive as that on the previous Mark III and Mark IV stock, and they're also covered in this hard-wearing, harsher material. The start of a train journey. One of the great sensations in life. As we pull out of Edinburgh, a real sense of excitement for the journey ahead.
you can afford it, I'd recommend treating yourself to first class. The seats are better, they recline, and you get a table at every seat. Not to mention the complimentary food and drink for the duration of your journey. In first class, you also tend to avoid the screaming kids and their parents who try to entertain their two little cherubs for five hours by throwing parties, singing songs and clapping. Those horrific journeys are firmly etched in my memory. The East Coast Main Line, one of the classic routes, down to Berwick, over the Border Bridge and along the Northumberland Cliffs towards Newcastle. If you watch closely, you can see the Border Post flash past the window. As I travel this route, I always get a sense of nostalgia. This, after all, was the very same route that was previously dominated by Gresley's A3 and A4 Pacifics, the mighty Deltics, and then the iconic HST and Class 91s. As a railway modeler, it's always a great treat for me to travel on the real railway. I'm constantly looking at the landscape, stations, line-side detail, and overall infrastructure. It gives me some real inspiration for working on my Dean Park layout. Time to hurry things up a bit with this time lapse. In this 40 second clip, I've travelled just under 20 miles in complete comfort. Now you can say what you like, but I think we've got a pretty good intercity network in the UK. Passing Bounds Green Depot now, in previous years the home of the Intercity HSTs and Class 91s. However, since 2021 it switched over to maintaining the LNER Hitachi Azuma fleet.
As I glided into the splendour of King's Cross, another enjoyable rail journey drew to a close. While on the train down, I posted a few photos on my Facebook. Simon Race, who's a train manager for the LNER, got in touch to say that he was just on his way to King's Cross on the celebrating Scotland Azuma. When the train drew in, I rushed to see it, only to be joined by Simon a few minutes later, and we had a good chat. It's always great to meet guys who are into the hobby, and it was a real pleasure to meet Simon. While on my connection to meet Richard, I received a message from Gareth Perkins, who follows me on social media. He sent me this photo of me taking a photo of the Azuma. He'd been on the platform with his son Ryan, and thought it was me. So a shout out to Gareth and his son Ryan, who also goes by the name of Mini Snapper on YouTube. Day 2 was mainly taken up by a very enjoyable day at the Great Central Railway in Lothborough. A couple of more firsts for me on this outing, as I rode behind a BR Standard 9F and a Class 45 Peak. Both very impressive beasts, the sheer size of both locos really surprised me somewhat. The 9F sounded fantastic, so I'll shut up now and allow you to have a listen.
For this leg of the journey I managed to position myself right behind the peak, and while it was just coasting along for most of the journey, it still sounded and smelled brilliant. It was the first time I'd seen a peak up close. Richard got very excited upon seeing the peak was operating the day we were there. I have to say, I was really chuffed myself.
really enjoy going to a preserve railway is a chance to step back in time and appreciate the scale of engineering involved during the steam into early dieselisation period. What local did you prefer there, the 9F or the Peak? Let me know in the comments section of this video. The next two days were spent at Richard's impressive Everard Junction layout. My last visit was in 2019, however since then Richard has pretty much ripped up and redone all the scenic landscape. It was a great chance for me to have a real look around the layout, check some of the details that he's added and see the many improvements he has made. I always enjoy seeing his sweeping curves and elevated track. The sight of a full length train making his way around the corner is terrific. Just before I arrived, Richard had been working flat out to get his new track plan laid at the mouth of the station section. I have to say it looks impressive. We spent a bit of time chatting over what details would look good here. It's good to share ideas. I even picked up details of a few kits that I'll be adding to Dean Park too. I even spotted a Dean Park designed lineside hut. Another small project that we've been working on um, when I've been down visiting Richard is the, the Peak Cabs. Now these are a West Hill Wagon Works 3D um, printed kit. They come bare plastic, 
and as you can see here I've got four of the cabs in different stages of distress if you like from the freshly painted in BR blues and BR diesel cab grey and as we work our way back which I'll show you in a moment we add some washes and some different tones of weathering into the actual cab as well until we get to the back one here in its dilapidated state. What we've got with the first one is I've primed it with Tamiya primer and then I've gone over it with the BR cab grey on the nose there and inside the, the driver's cab and then what we've done is I've uh, used some BR blue and BR faded blue from the rail match range and given it a varied um, tone um, to give almost a, a faded streaky appearance onto the actual blue of the, the body. What we then did is we glossed the sides of the cab to apply the decals and then sealed them in place with a satin varnish before taking the acrylic paint pen and adding some white handrails. The second model, um, we've taken Tamiya panel line wash and basically washed all the, the light grey areas inside and at the front of the nose there. And that really helps accentuate some of the 3D printed detail that uh, Chris down at West Hill Wagon Works has achieved on this particular model. We've also used some of the panel wash along the rivet lines and raised detail just to really make them pop. The next stage is taking that wash back using just a, a cotton bud with some enamel thinners to kind of try and bring back some of the grey and it leaves the wash in all the recesses and it really looks quite grotty and, and um, grimy. And the same with the, the interior of the cab. As you can also see we've removed some of it from the raised areas, um, obviously panel join lines, rivet pattern and it's left in the recesses. It really does start to, to make the model pop. The final stage is really adding in some uh, built up grime and rust using some um, acrylic paints and dabbed on with a sponge and then taking the Tamiya weathering masters really to um, bring out some of the detail on the actual cab and the nose section here as well and that really now does represent uh, basically a disposed of peak cab lying at the side of a, a track in maybe say a scrap yard or a depot. So what I'll do in this video, we'll work with Richard to take you from this stage at the front here all the way through to the finished article. So the first thing we're going to do is take the panel line wash to this cab. You can see obviously it looks very fresh and a lot of the detail is difficult to see and also you know it's very pristine and sort of almost white looking in appearance. You can see by comparison on this one how filthy everything is, especially on the inside. So we'll take the Tamiya panel line wash. This is the black wash. The dark grey is also quite useful. And you don't have to uh, worry too much about what you're doing, just go all over the details, especially that door. And you can see how it runs into all of the little nooks and crannies. And then once this is dried, we can come back and remove the excess with some of the cotton buds, a little bit of enamel thinner. But uh, for this initial stage, you don't have to worry too much about being absolutely perfect in where you get the wash. Just make sure you get decent coverage so it picks out all of those details. And then you can start to see all the, uh, the rivet detail around this portion here is all now showing up and previously you couldn't really see that. So washes are really great for highlighting all of that sort of stuff.
Okay, so we've applied the wash all over the model. You can see we've not been particularly careful about where it goes. Uh, capillary action draws the wash into all of the detail and highlights all of that. I'll now take a cotton bud, which I've soaked in a little bit of enamel thinner, and just wipe down the excess, and we'll get some of that cab grey to show back through. But ultimately, it will be toned down and faded over how it was originally, and all of the wash that's got in all of those details, that will stay behind. So we should get a nice bit of relief and build up in all of that detail. Do similar for the roof, brush all the, the wash in the direction that rainwater would likely run off of the roof so that you get the streaking effect that you're after, but it's all going in the right direction. And you get a nice build up in the cant rail around the corner there where the, the cotton bud can't get to it so you get all of that dark colour left behind it gives a nice bit of grime and relief uh, to the overall appearance of the model So now we've removed most of the black wash from the cab, we've got a nice streaking effect and the, the white handrails have toned down, we've got a nice bit of grime in all the build up, it's particularly nice uh, in the back of what would be the, uh, the gauge cluster in the real thing. So that looks quite good but there's no rust and this is a scrap locomotive, there's going to be rust, especially around the back where it's been cut from the rest of the peak body shell. So the next thing to do, take some acrylic paint and in this case uh, Vallejo uh, German black brown it's a very dark brown color so it's good for representing that sort of established rust that's you know a year or so old so I just put some of that onto a bit of plastic any kit or bit of film or packaging that you get from stuff when you're, you're doing railway modeling just keep hold of these because they're super useful for just mixing up paint so I'll put a small amount of the black brown on there. And then this is just a piece of packing foam, packing sponge. And we'll get most of that off until it's almost dried out. So think of that a little bit like uh, dry brushing. And then we'll go over to the model and we'll just stipple it on there. And just very gently build up the effect in layers and you'll get little bits of pitting and, and rust and it will be as if the paint has flaked off of the real thing. If you get too much on and you don't like the appearance you can always come back with a little bit of paint thinner and just wipe it off and we'll go all over the model. You can see just on the handrails there it shows up nicely we've just got some nice little bits of 
rust pitting going on there. So that's most of the rusting effects completed now. So we've got lots of uh, sort of wiped down dirt from the panel line wash that we've added earlier. And then there's lots of sort of uh, sponge uh, stippled on rust, which looks like pitting in the paints as if the paint's flaking off and bits of the uh, metal worker rusting underneath. So all we're gonna do now is just add a little bit of rust that's been washed by the brain down the sides of the body. And for that, I'm gonna use the Tamiya Weathering Master. This is set B, which has quite a decent rust color in there and they do come with a little applicator in the kit, uh, but in this case, I'm just using another cotton bud. So we'll do these two here. I've made sure they're ever so slightly different. You can see this one's got more of the rust uh, sponged onto the roof. Not every cab would be the same. If you had a couple of cabs together from different locos and various bits of scrap metal lying around, each one will be in a different condition. So follow an overall theme, but try and get a little bit of variation in there so that the cabs have got different levels of the wash inside. Some are cleaner than others, just depends how it goes. So I literally just take a small amount of the weathering powder and just apply it in a few small areas, being careful not to overdo it. And if you do get some you know, where it's too much, like that bit there, that might be a little bit too much. You can just go over that with a little bit of the uh, enamel thinner or acrylic thinner, and it will just wash off and you can start again.
Well, that's all four of the peak cabs finished. Um, I don't know about you, Richard, but I think they look pretty stunning. Yeah, I'm quite impressed with those. It's just similar techniques to the weathering that I've done in the past and you know various things that a lot of us do on the layouts, but you've got the excuse to really take it to the full extent and go really crazy with some of the effects, which you're always a bit nervous about doing on, say, stuff that's running on the rails. But in the case of scrap equipment, it's been a good opportunity to get quite creative with the washes and powders and things like that. When I was doing it, obviously, I've used the Weathering Masters quite extensively at Dean Park, so I was quite comfortable with that aspect, but uh, I really enjoyed using the, the sponging technique for the rust. That's something I've not really employed yet, and I'll certainly be doing on other projects um, at Dean Park when I get home. Um, but yeah, it was been, it's been good to kind of learn new techniques there and blend in you know, what you're familiar with with something that you might not be, and I'd say to anyone watching this, you know, have a go at these. It's, it's only through trial and error. I sat and watched Richard do it, then I tried it myself. Um, so yeah that's that's the way you learn really yeah you just experiment and just you know take it little steps do a little bit and go oh, quite like that and then just take it a little bit further if you feel comfortable try different things out different techniques personally for me the most powerful thing I've started to do in the last sort of couple of years is the use of washes uh, particularly the Tamiya uh, panel line wash a very very strong uh, vibrant color whether it be the light gray or a white or in this case the black and uh, it just makes all of that detail pop and you can remove as much as you want and add as much as you want it's very controllable so you never really get yourself into a situation where you make a mistake because it can always be removed or put back on again yeah so that's the the peak project if you want to get your hands on some of these cabs and um, head over to the west hill wagon works website and um, the link to that is in the description below there's also um i believe cabs for the class 25 It was cool to see some of my locals and rolling stock run on Richard's layout. I've got so much footage that I can't share it all in this video, but I'll be sure to feature it in future uploads. After an immensely enjoyable four days, I unfortunately had to pack up all my stuff and head homeward. However, one highlight remained, and that was the trip home on the Caledonian sleeper from Houston. Houston always reminds me of a giant bath. Lots of smooth, slippery marble and glass surfaces so that people can be sloshed quickly and efficiently around. I was really excited to see and get on board the new Mark V sleeper accommodation. However, I wasn't prepared for just how narrow and tight the space on these coaches was. It took me by surprise and I was initially taken aback. As you can see from these clips, space is at a premium. After my initial shock, I grew to appreciate and enjoy the snug surroundings. The cabins were cleverly designed and all you needed was to hand. My service departed London at 23.50 and boarding commenced around about an hour beforehand which gave me plenty of time to have a look around and walk the 21 coach train to the leading local. Just before retiring for the night I wanted to film the departure. By pure luck the dispatcher stood right outside my window.
Before I knew it, we'd drawn into Edinburgh Waverley at 7.20 in the morning and it was time to depart. My first sleeper experience had gone well. Okay, I didn't get a full night's sleep due to the late departure and then taking some time to settle. So next time I'll be sure to try and get to, to sleep prior to departure. But all in all, I'd recommend that you try it for yourself. Well that concludes my big trip south. If you're still with me, I hope you enjoyed it. What part did you enjoy the most? I look forward to reading your thoughts in the comments section. I'll be back very soon with more progress from Dean Park, with work on the Great Wall and the Mark 1 Coach project that started in the last update. In the meantime, thanks for watching, take care and cheers for now.